I am so excited to share a message with you called The Secret to Your Future. The Secret to Your Future. One of the most felt needs right now, people are asking the question, what about my future? What does my future look like? Um, some of your teenagers are asking, what does my future look like? College students are asking, what is the future going to look like? Uh, retirees are asking, what will my future look like? Empty nesters are starting to wonder, what will my future look like? And so for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about the secret to your future. Now, the reason I would use the word secret is because I think secrets are defined by either a lot of people don't know about it or a lot of people don't act on it. And so what you're gonna discover is what I'm gonna share with you is like, well, that's not really a secret, except that it seems like it is because very few people walk it out and live it. And I wanna encourage you today in the next few minutes, if we walk out of here into 102 degrees and we live out what we're gonna talk about, um, I think uh, you can be confident in all that God has for you in your future. And everybody said, <laughs> hey man, you already sound just hot and fatigued. Um, also, I want to talk to you a little, let me just say a couple of opening statements before we get going. Here's the plan going forward. For those that don't know, um, the world has changed as we know it. You can look around and figure that out. National attendance in local churches is uh, 30% of physical attendance is back in the church in the United States of America, uh, which, which means it's, it's really a small fraction, only because life has changed, people are on their computers more, people are spending weekends on the lake or whatever. By the way, you know me, 11 years of pastoring, 12 years of pastoring this church, when it is sunny, you've been in those services where I'm like, why are you not on the lake? Get the app, get on the lake, Watch the sermon and be with your family and have a barbecue. That's awesome too, but I'm so glad um, that you're here. Here's what I'm gonna do. For, we've been praying about this. I've been asking God, God, what do you want me to do? Um, in case you haven't noticed, there is a lot of people that don't know the love of Jesus and don't know the forgiveness of Jesus. And so we're gonna keep living life on mission. Chelsea and I are gonna be live once a month here at Kirkland. We're gonna let you know when that is. I'll let you know what services I'm preaching live so we can gather, we can celebrate. The other times during the month here at the Kirkland location is gonna be a great sermon, there's gonna be a great kids ministry, youth ministry, but we're also encouraging you, if you're not able to drive and come to a facility, you can use the app, you can do church at home, you can have a barbecue, you can connect with neighbors. By the way, a really big part of our lifestyle as Jesus followers is to love your neighbor. And so I'm so serious about this these days, like go over, knock on the door, bring them a fruitcake, make strawberry shortcake, like, you know, take, take, take over some barbecue and let's meet our neighbors and let's care for them and let's listen and, and laugh and love and serve. And so, uh, and by the way, um, the most committed people a part of the church come about once a month. So if you want to gather once a month and celebrate, you want to come every week, there's going to be services. Here's what I'm really excited about. Uh, much has been made of, um, you know, are Judah and Chelsea in Seattle anymore? Uh, yes, we are. Now, we were in quarantine in Los Angeles. And by the way, where you were quarantined, you stayed. I've had several people run into me like, so you moved to LA? And I'm like, no, I was quarantined in Los Angeles. And if you've been to LA, a quarantine in LA is, it's pretty populated and dense and difficult and challenging. But this is home. Um, the Seattle Seahawks are the only football team that matters in the whole wide world in the whole wide world. And the team that matters the least in the whole wide world is the San Francisco 49ers. Um, red is the color of hell. Blue is the color of the sky. So you do the math. I think it's pretty obvious. Um, but this, th this is home. And we have never been more in love with the city. But, you know, we actually have um, our, the... the Almost our entire staff lives in this city. Pastors live in this city. In fact, today, if you have not met a pastor or if there's something we can do to serve you or help you or support your family, out in the lobby, there's gonna be pastors in the lobby waiting to shake your hand, meet with you, pray with you, talk with you. 
anything we can do for you. There'll be pastors identifying those pastors will be done. Oh, maybe a name tag. Cole, are, are the pastors going to be wearing name tags? All of the pastors will be wearing name tags. That's amazing, except Louis Vermont. But all of the pastors, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, so you can, uh, you can meet up. We are here to, to serve you. All right, you ready to jump in? Ready to jump into the scripture? I have so much to say about life and culture and stuff that's going on, and I'm just super excited about it, but um, I'll just work it in to the sermon. I'm going to preach for the next two and a half hours. I'm kidding. I wish in my dreams. For those that did come on Easter, I did set my personal record, and I think I preached one sermon 83 minutes. Yeah. How many are grateful that's not going to happen today? How many just feel really, oh, no hands go up. Two, two, Colby, put your hand down. Oh, man. All right, let's jump in, band. Thank you so much. Um, if you guys don't mind coming back at the end. It's a boy band today. Look at these guys. This is a good-looking boy band. <laughs> Mustache of the day right here. Tattoos, ooh, those are evil. Those are bad. Who let the guy with tattoos on the stage? That's unbiblical. All right, things we used to care about in church. Some of you are like, I still do. Sorry, okay. If tattoos bother you, we have just begun, okay? So, so, oh man, okay. Um, have you seen this Tracy Morgan commercial that's out right now? Uh, it's pretty hilarious. Tracy Morgan is a stand-up comedian. I'm not saying that you should listen to all of his contents. And we're like, I think he cusses in his stand-up. Okay, all right. But Tracy Morgan, who is a very popular comedian, has this commercial, and uh, I think it's like on mortgages and stuff. I won't say the brand because, you know, we're not going to, this isn't about advertising. Um, but uh, the, the, the commercial goes, I think he's in like the bathtub of these people's home or the home that they're walking through. And the wife asks the husband, can we afford this home? And he goes, I'm pretty sure. And Tracy Morgan, who I think is eating berries sitting in the, in the tub, it's hilarious. He's like, pretty sure. Pretty sure. You, you need to be certain. He's like, let me, let, me, let me tell you about pretty sure. And all of a sudden it cuts to like they're in the woods and they're hiking. And he, he picks up a flower and he's like, I'm pretty sure this isn't poisonous. And he like eats the flower. Have you seen this commercial? Or he's like driving in a car and they're about to do one of those jumps. Shout out to Fast and Furious. Have you seen that trailer, by the way? <laughs> Vin Diesel drives off a cliff, hooks into a rope that takes the car and swings him across like the Grand Canyon. I'm like... What I love about Fast and Furious is how realistic it is. It's, it's actually based on a true story. I don't know if you knew that. But anyways, Tracy Morgan is like about to jump this bridge and he's got the whole family in this like car and he's like, I'm pretty sure we're gonna make it. You know, and they just like take off. Um, pretty hilarious, right? And, and the whole point of the, the, I think there's actually multiple vignettes, multiple commercials is you need to be certain. You need to be certain. I kind of think that's how we feel right now about our future. I'm pretty sure, like, I'm pretty sure, like, you're kind of driving your proverbial car going like, I'm pretty sure 2022 20, is going to be good, here we go, you know, and, and I guess I want to be Tracy Morgan today, and I want to say, you need to be more certain than pretty sure, right, like, you, 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 when you look into your future, what's left of your short stay on earth, I don't think pretty sure is good enough. I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure. I think there needs to be some certainty and some conviction about your future. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, Judah, that's, that's a great concept, but, but I'm really actually not in control. How many have figured out in the last couple of years, like we are fragile, we are finite, we are not in control. Last night I was in Miami, Florida, having dinner with uh, Rich Wilkerson Jr. and Don Cherie, who pastor a great community called Vu Church, which you helped to start, by the way. That church in five years is thousands and thousands of people. It is incredible. And while we were having dinner, tears filled our eyes and we began to cry, realizing that 10 minutes down the street, 156 people are still missing in rubble. I mean, if we haven't figured out anything, if you're like me, I can't keep up with the tragedies right now. I just can't keep up. It, it seems like every day someone's like, did you hear? And I'm like, and did you hear used to be an exciting statement to me. What? Now I'm like, uh, what? 
right? Another catastrophe, another tragedy. It's so overwhelming, right? So we have figured out very quickly that uncertainty seems to be a predominant part of the human experience. So maybe you're listening to me going, Judah, you're asking for certainty about our future, but if we've learned anything in the last, you know, 16, 18, two years, months, years, it's that life is very, very uncertain. I'm so glad you said that because I want to read to you one of the most quoted verses in all of the Bible. Jeremiah, where do you think I'm going? 29, 11. Okay, if you're sitting next to a good Christian, they just said it out loud to impress you. Jeremiah 29, 11. It's 29, 11. It's 29, 11. I have that one memorized. 29, 11. Okay, we get it. We get it. Uh, by the way, good to see the Kapuzis here this morning. I love you guys. Susie Kapuzi used to teach me in Sunday school, by the way. Chelsea, Susie Kapuzi. She taught us in like in, in, in junior high. Is that a true story? Am I making that up? Portland, Oregon, Susie Capuzzi was my middle school Sunday school teacher. So if you don't think my theology is good, blame Susie Capuzzi. That's her name, by the way. That's her married Susie Capuzzi. Tell me that's not the best name you've ever heard in your whole life. Okay, no one has a better name, Susie Capuzzi. I love you. I just want to keep saying it, you know. Listen to this in the message, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know what I'm doing. Wow. That'd be worth coming to church for, that in the air conditioning. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. I want to underscore this statement this morning. I know what I'm doing. Let me be real clear. There is not a preacher or a pastor right now who knows exactly what they're doing. You need to know that. Some of you are like, a lot of change has been going on in church home. Guess what? A lot of change has been going on in the church. And if the church doesn't change, the church isn't going to be nearly as effective as she can be. Let me tell you, there is a lot. <clears throat> Let me talk about real estate agents. I got friends. I know a lot of real estate agents that are like, the market is so wild and so crazy, I don't even know how to keep up. There are a lot of industries. There are a lot of kind of roles and professional posts that people are holding right now, and they're like, I don't really know what I'm doing. The world has changed as we know it, right? The price of lumber just dropped, but it's still really high if you've been keeping track, right? I mean, it's, I, I've talked with people who tell friends, we're building a house right now, and friends are like offended. Wow, you must have a lot of money to be building right now. And it's like, you can't even build a house without being offensive right now, right? Like, it's like, you can't, it's just, it's a very uncertain time. I want you to know that I don't know everything I'm doing. I just told you I'm coming once a month live and somebody like, Judah, I don't know about that. Well, neither do I, but I know that God has told us to do this and this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna try to reach more lost people, but I don't totally know what I'm doing. Is it fair to say that I've never been 42 before? I've never been this old. I've never been this far in history before. I've never been through a pandemic, and I've certainly never been in Seattle in 111 degrees, I can tell you that much. That has never happened in my lifetime. I, I don't really know what I'm doing. One of my favorite things right now, and I'm not sure it's a, it's a really good practice, but it's become a habit, is I end pretty much most sentences now with going, I, I, you know, I don't know. Are you like me? Like, I think about you know, maybe leasing a car, I, I don't know. So you know, like getting a little blizzard tonight, you know, it's like Oreo blizzard, but I don't know. You know, just thinking about watching reruns of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air tonight, but I don't know. You know, like, should we start, should we travel a little bit? I don't know. I was going to maybe wear a mask, but I don't know. I was going to go say hi to those people, but do, do, I don't know. Are they going to be mad if I get too close? Yesterday at this funeral, um, I it's been so long since we were all maskless. Now, you, you, you go to Florida, there's a lot of masklessness going on, okay? Different cultures, come on somebody. And so this sweet man who loved Jesus, and most of the people at the funeral didn't know Jesus, which is one of the reasons I went, because I wanted to tell them about the hope we have in Jesus, and he got right here. And I was shocked. I could smell his breath. 
And he was like, because he was telling me his testimony. He was addicted to alcohol and Jesus set him free. And two years ago, he gave his life to Jesus. But he was right here. And I tell you, Sam, it's the truth. I kept doing one of these. I was like, oh, man, that's, that's incredible. Oh, man. And then you could see on his face, he was like, that's weird. And he would just like keep moving closer. And I'm like, bro, we're just coming out of this thing, man. And to be honest, I don't like this in any situation. You know, like, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if that's necessary, but there's a lot of uncertainty and I don't know. And yet Jeremiah 29, 11, the the reason I read to you in the message is it starts with, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. That's a quote from God. I know what I'm doing, God. I know what I'm doing, Jesus. I know what I'm doing, Holy Spirit. I know what I'm doing, creator of heaven and earth. I know what I'm doing, the star breather and the ocean maker. I know what I'm doing. And I sit in the heavens and I laugh at all who oppose me, for the the, the earth is my ottoman. It's my footstool. I hear somebody trying to help me preach. (laughs) Might as well. It's 102. Right? Like, let you... I know what I'm doing. That's, that's really all you needed to come for this morning. I mean, you can get out some lipstick and write it. You can get out a permanent marker and write it on your mirror. What's that? It's a quote from God. What's, I know what I'm doing. With your life, I know what I'm doing. With your future, I know what I'm doing. With your past, I know what I'm doing. With your trauma, I know what I'm doing. With your loss, I know what I'm doing. With that death of a loved one, I know what I'm doing. I I know what I'm doing, God says. And by the way, with his knowledge, look what he does with his knowledge. We'll put it up on the screen again. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. I mean, just those two statements could set you free. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Let me tell you about me. I don't really know what I'm doing, and I definitely don't have it all planned out. (laughs) By the way, don't have it planned out if you don't know what you're doing. Right? This isn't isn't like, we're not even exegeting original language here, okay? We're just making obvious assumptions to the text. If you don't know what you're doing, Don't plan it out. A lot of people are making plans, but they don't know what they're doing. Plans will not make up for your lack of knowledge. But there is one who knows what he's doing. This isn't my sermon. These are opening statements. He knows what he's doing, and he has it all planned out. He has it all planned out. It's amazing to me how convinced we are that God knows what he's doing and has it all planned out when his plan mirrors our plan and we feel really good about it. Have you noticed that? Like I feel, you know, it's amazing how God starts changing our plans when our plans don't line up with his plans. And so we're like, I think God is actually changing his plans to more match up with my plans. You have to know this about God. You have to, I'm going to, Come right down here. You have to know this about God. Um, His plans, wait for it, are not your plans. Well, but my plans sometimes can be, yeah, yeah. Parts and pieces, yeah. But he knows what he's doing. He has it all planned out. He knows what he's doing. He has it all planned out. The difference between you and me, the difference between us and God is we don't really know what we're doing and God forbid we have it all planned out. The just shall live by Faith. Faith. What's faith? Divine persuasion. You know what I wish faith was? I wish faith was um, God showing us the whole plan. (laughs) How good would that be? What do you want to walk up by faith? Me too. Best life ever. What's the walk of faith? When God shows you everything you're going to do in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s and your 50s and your 60s and your 70s and your 80s. And you're like, what are you doing? I'm following Jesus. It's the best. Except he, he usually doesn't do that. And then like bad stuff happens to good people and And then good stuff happens to bad people. That's one of the worst parts of it all. God, they're they're not good. And it's kind of like, oh yeah, that's right, neither am I. But we 
We don't, we look in a mere dimly, the Bible says. We don't see it all. Even the prophets prophesy in part. They don't see the whole picture. They don't see everything that's going on, but there is one who does. I know what I'm doing. One of my favorite statements lately is, um, God is really good at being God. You know what you're not good at? Being God. Let me say it. Some of you are like, I'm not trying to be God, Judah. That's offensive. Fair enough. You know what you're not good at? Being the commander of your own life. You know what you're not good at? You know what I'm not good at? Being in control. You know what God's great at? Commander in chief, control, lordship, leadership, destiny, direction, purpose, planning, architecting. He's like been doing it a long time. So we all gonna sit here and start acting like God doesn't know what he's doing. Darius Daniels, a friend of mine who pastors a great church, a couple of churches actually, in different locations, he said, um, faith is uh, acting like God means what he says. I just, I think God means what he says. I, again, this isn't, this, I haven't got to my sermon yet, but this, I got it all planned out. I know what I'm doing. Do you, do, do you think that 2020 and 2021 got God thinking, Maybe I don't know it all. Maybe I don't have it all planned out. Isn't it funny in our finiteness, we project, don't we? So we superimpose on God all the time. God, you must feel a little bit, how should I say, anxious like me right now. You must wonder if this is gonna work out. <laughs> it's like, oh, you are so cute. <laughs> You're the cutest. You're like a little goldfish swimming around and you just, you know, you're just tiny and you think the whole world is your little bowl and you don't realize it's on a, like one little table in one little room of an entire house. And you're like, this is my bowl. And here's my little rocks at the bottom and my fake little tree that I swim. Anybody have a goldfish? I killed more goldfish than I can even count because I was like, let's, let's, let's feed them a ton. That's what I did with my goldfishes. I'm like, ah, they're hungry. My dad's like, you're going to kill them. I'm like, no, I'm going to make them big. Right? Like, we're down here swimming in our little bowls going, you must be really nervous because my bowl is pretty shaken right now. And God's like, you're so cute and adorable and I love you so much and I'm not trying to be patronizing. But no. No. Oh, and... My least favorite part of this sermon, this spontaneous, unprepared, preliminary sermon, is um, the world doesn't revolve around me. Ugh. But what if it did? That'd be kind of fun. Do you know what I mean? Like, but let's pretend it does, because that's how we started life. Let's just be infants forever. The world is all about me. And I determine what God's doing in the earth based on me. <laughs> um, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I want to show you <clears throat> another famous passage. And I want to give you um, three thoughts that I think function a lot like a secret that'll unfold for you and unpack for you a level of confidence and conviction and assurance for your tomorrow. But have no fear, for tomorrow will never come, for when it does, it will only ever be today. Which leads us to the very simple thought that life is only ever today. That's all it is. It's just right now. It's just today. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow will come and it will be Today, Jesus says, just, just be focused on today. And so I want to give you a gift today in the form of a couple of scriptures to help you just embrace today. You, 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 you can't live your career for the next 10 years. All you can do is live today. Some of us are so worked up about the next three months. You can't live the next three months today. You can just live today. And you know what I love about God? 
He is our ever present help in time of need today. Today. Isn't it amazing the eternal one cares about your today? He architected linear time and space. It was his idea to help our little brains, our goldfish brains, if you will, to kind of just like not get overwhelmed. And you know why we get overwhelmed is because we pretend that we're not the finite, limited beings that we are, and we try to play God for our future. And we try to live out the next three months, and we don't just live out the next three minutes. Some of you, your consternation, your pain, and your anxiety has nothing to do with what's happening in this room right now or even what's on the docket for today. It's something that hasn't even happened yet. You've already had the conversation. It didn't go so well, so you're even more anxious. You've already had the meeting. You've already, you've already filed for divorce in your mind. You've already filed for bankruptcy in your mind. And you have forgotten that God, between now and then, God can do a miracle. Let's just do, let's just do today. And that, bring, that brings me to Matthew's gospel, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16. Everybody still with me? Matthew 16. I love you so much. This is so much fun. Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must. You must. That's imperative language. That's imperative. You must. Okay, so Jesus is not suggesting this. He's saying that this is like essential. You must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? But the Son of Man will come with the angels and the glory of the Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. Whew. That is a lot to cover in the next two hours. But we're going to do it. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, three things I want to identify for you. We're going to try to unpack them very briefly. Jesus says, give up your life. Point number one, give up. Let me put that up there. Thank you. Give up. Point number two, take up your cross. And point number three, for my sake. If you can begin to understand these three concepts, it's going to give you the ability to let go of your next three months or three days that you're all worked up about that you actually can't live in and it'll help you live today and trust God for your future. I treat it a lot, a, lot, a lot like a secret because as you'll discover as we unpack these three statements, a lot of people don't apply them, don't walk in them, don't utilize them only because it's natural and normal not to. These are not intuitive. Now, the Holy Spirit helps us live like this, but we naturally wake up as the captain of our own ship. Have you noticed that? Do you wake up thinking that you hold the steering wheel? Do you wake up thinking you hold the controls, that you are in the control, you know, you're in the tower, the proverbial tower at the airport, like you are directing traffic, you have to control the future of your kids, you have to make sure your marriage works, you have to make sure that your business gets off the ground, you have to make sure everybody's happy with you, you have to make, do you wake up like that? Because I do, most days. Right? I don't wake up and be like, oh my God, Lord, I give you everything. I am like so yours. I am your servant. Here's my life. Like, I usually don't wake up like that. Right? I usually wake up and I'm like, all right, it's, it's going to be a great day, I think. I hope. Right? Welcome to 2021. I don't know. 111. Right? Like, we prayed our whole lifetime for nice weather in Seattle. We didn't mean this much, Lord. You know, like, <laughs> we want hot, we want heat, we want sun. Oh, God, send rain. Like, right. How fickle are we? If one more Seattleite complains to me, oh, this weather, stop! We are so confused. We are the most confused state in the union, right? <laughs> we don't know what we want, right? Okay, so I don't think we want 111, though, to be honest. We're, we don't live in Phoenix for a reason, right? For a reason. Okay, so we, 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 I will say that. First statement I want us to look at, give up. Give up. And I want to say, if you get nothing else from this particular segment, get this. There is a, a lifestyle that I'm going to try to kind of summarize in a statement. And this lifestyle is this. It's giving living or living by giving. But let's call it giving living because that kind of feels good. Giving living 
is the secret you're looking for. Now, why you buy into giving living, we're going to talk about it, because I think you've got to buy into giving living, not for the results that it yields, but for the person who demonstrates it and gave you everything. But giving living is the secret you're looking for. It's giving living. It's giving living. Now, that is not the mentality of our culture right now at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Our culture now is training us every day through technology and other means that we should ask, what will be given to me? What will be given to me? Now, I'm not saying that in some cases that is not relevant and, and all these things, but we, we, for those of us that follow Jesus, it's imperative for us to understand that his teaching is quite opposite oftentimes from the cultural norms. He promotes giving living. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, Jesus is quoted in the early church by saying, you will be far happier giving than getting. So giving is the key to happiness, not getting. Let's just set the record straight. That, that's really helpful right now, isn't it? Talk about your future, and maybe you're thinking, what am I going to get in my future? What am I going to get in my job? What am I going to get in this marriage? What am I going to get through my kids? What am I going to get through? What am I, I, what, what, I, what, what am I, are you like me? Like, one of the most discouraging parts of my life right now is surfing Netflix or one of the other platforms looking for a show that will give me what I want. Have you noticed this? And, and by the way, there's a whole trend right now in content creation, and that is you have to capture the audience like within two to three minutes, they say, because there's so much competition in content. And so basically, by the way, this is shaping our brains and our priorities and our emotions and our thoughts. We are being trained every day. And I'm listen, I love content. I love shows. I love movies. Don't misunderstand me. Nothing inherently wrong. We just have to be on guard and be aware that a lot of this content is created to serve up and tantalize your desires and what you want very, very fast so that you stay in the show, in the movie, and you watch it through. So the views will go up and the money will be made. Now, back in the day, do you remember movies used to start slow? Anybody remember those days? Movies used to be like, there's just like somebody in a field reading a book. And somebody rides up on a horse like, how are you? Hey, you know, it's like, what's this? It's the man from Snowy River, right? Like, it, it just, it started out slow. One of my favorite movies of all time is Glory. Watch Glory with Denzel Washington, right? And it's like, there's whole like 15, 20 minutes where it's like, I don't know if anyone's talked in a while in this movie, right? But nowadays it's like, hey, 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 how are you? Oh, oh, you know, right? Because we're being served what we want. Not click, I don't like that. Fast forward a couple episodes and ah, something else, let's go, right? And if you're like me, like you spend two hours later, you're like, we still haven't watched anything. Why do I feel so empty and hollow and so used? <laughs> this feels gross. Because the whole thing is oriented around what you want, what you want, what you're looking for. What you, and that's not how God set up the universe. You will be far happier giving. Chelsea and I just signed a deal. We're going to start a podcast. I hope that you listen to it. Okay, we're going to record uh, next week our first few episodes. We're going to have guests and that sort of thing. And for those that get offended with these things, the, 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 the podcast will not be me preaching. I won't be necessarily quoting scripture because we're going to try to Trojan horse this thing. And we're going to try to get the message and love of Jesus out to more and more and more and more people. We're going to have lots of guests that don't know Jesus. And we're going to talk about Jesus. And they won't know we're talking about Jesus. But it's going to be, it's going to be really really awesome but but one of the themes on this podcast is we're going to we're going to teach people that you got to live, live a life of giving and then when they ask why we're going to tell them about the one who gave everything but life's about giving we, we we've been at home wanting what we can get world's opening it back up again and we got to ask ourselves what can i give what difference can i make where can i go and who can i serve now you're like, Judah, here comes the preacher. He wants to up the attendance and, get, you know, up the giving. No, 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 no. This is about living life on mission. This is about your happiness and your fulfillment and your future. And the pathway to your future of fulfillment is giving, not getting. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you got to. Give up your own way. I know this sounds odd, but one of the most remarkable themes that keeps surfacing in my heart post, 
I don't know if you can even say post-COVID right now, okay? But we're, we're trying to, right? We're trying to. And I, I mean, no disrespect, by the way. I literally have a friend right now who has COVID vaccinated and one of the 4% that actually contracted it again. So this is very real and we need to be very careful. I want to be sensitive. This is still uh, something that we need to be aware of and prayerful and careful. So please hear me, right? And, and that's it's one of the reasons probably a lot of people are still unsure of even to, to come back to public gatherings like this. And I respect that. There is no shame, by the way, right? I was in an airplane last night for five and a half hours and I was thinking something about this doesn't feel right. <laughs> Okay, and we're sneezing and coughing, and I'm like, I don't think the masks are helping here, folks. Okay, the lady next to me is blowing her nose, and her nose is running, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Like, and it's not that I'm afraid. I'm just like, I really don't need to be quarantined for another for two weeks. Like, that wouldn't be productive for for raising my teenagers who need my attention every single second. Do you have teenagers who talk a lot? So do I. Okay. Anyways, you're like, Judy, you talk a lot. I know the sins of my youth have come back to haunt me in my adult years. Hey dad, hey dad, hey dad, hey dad, hey dad. Stop talking. <laughs> Please. I know I named you Judah. I didn't literally mean to be me. You know, like I can't stand to be around me. But anyways, <laughs> that was funny. You gotta, here's the thing that keeps coming up. Give up. Give up, son. Give it up. Not give up your own way. I think quite literally means a number of different things, but one of it means is to, to give up. And here's what I think give up could mean for you. Stop keeping score in life. You need to stop. Stop keeping score. It's not how God works. Stop keeping score. By the way, marriage never works when you keep score. Friendships never work when you keep score. That's how you end friendships and end marriages when you keep score. Well, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff for you around this house and you do nothing for this family. That's score talk. You know, my friends, I'm always there for them. They're never there for me. That's score talk. That's not inherently wrong. It's normal, actually. But Jesus asked us to live a whole other different kind of life. Give it up. Stop keeping score. Another thing give up means is stop comparing yourself. Oh, we don't have a problem doing that, except we do it nonstop every day as we scroll. Compare, 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 compare. And even for those of us that are not, like comparison is not, my, it's, it's not a norm for my personality. My personality, my addiction is codependency. And so I went to therapy for like four days and I was hoping it would be like, you know, just some sexual addiction or, or substance addiction. Like, I don't want those, but I was like, just tell me. And they're like, oh, you're so cute. Your addiction is codependency. And I'm like, what's that mean? You're not okay until people are okay. I'm like, isn't that what pastoring is? I didn't know, you know, is that what we do? And they're like, no, that's unhealthy. Right. So I want everyone to like me. So comparison isn't my norm. My norm is like, do you like me? I think you're amazing. Tell me more about you. You're incredible. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. I love that shirt. You're incredible. Wow. Have you lost weight? Oh, my word. This is incredible. Right. So that's my so different personalities have different kind of things. But comparison, no matter your personality, is touching us all now because it's just built into our technological systems. Give up. Let go. Give up. Quit keeping score. Quit comparing yourself. And we'll talk more about how to do this. I, I think give up also means like, like give it. I want you to, what, what's it? You and God know what it is. Isn't this a bummer part of the sermon? Like, what's he saying? You know what I'm saying. That one thing you don't want to give up. It stinks, doesn't it? Well, I don't want you to. I mean, I just, I enjoy myself every now and again with this, that, and the other. But, but did God ask you to stop? I don't know, which usually means you do around this topic. I've been doing this a long time, guys. I've met with some more college men than you can imagine. And, I met, and, and here's the best way to start. By the way, if you want to be a pastor, here's a great way to do coffee with someone. Sit down and be like, is there one thing God's asking you to give up? I have a word for you. You need to give it up. It works every time. <laughs> that and to college men, do you have temptations with pornography? Like it works every time, right? Like those were the two things I would do, like pornography and something you need to give up. Maybe it's the same thing, you know, whatever. But like I pastored guys for a long, long time and still do, but there's always, hey, I'm talking to Christians for a moment. There's always, there's always it. And God's like, hey, just 
trust me with that. Trust you with dessert? Trust you with like my day off? Trust you with my entertainment? Trust you with my beverages? God, these aren't a big deal, I know, but I want it. See, I think we like, give up your own way. And we're like, yes, I will, God. We'd rather sing and worship than God say, I want you to stop eating sugar. And we're like, what? That can't be God. It doesn't matter to God. I'm his. He's like, you are, I'm so proud of you. Listen, I, I, don't, I don't want you to drink coffee anymore. Coffee? Some of you are like, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> so do I, I'm not stopping that. I'll tell you that right now, but I just threw it out there in case the shoe fit, but. Come on, some of you have been walking with Jesus long enough to know, sometimes he'll just ask for the simplest of things, but they're so simple. It's the last thing we want to give up. Hey, I want you to stop spending so much time in the morning getting ready and looking at yourself and making sure you look perfect. And I just want you to comb your hair and get dressed and I want you to trust me, go to, go to work. Got up 30, 40 minutes to get ready. Yeah, but you can do it in 10. And that's what I want you to do. It'd be good for yourself. I'm telling you guys, it's, he's actually a real person who has a real relationship with you. And if you have ever been married or dated someone for a long time, how long you get ready in the morning seems to come up. And in our relationship, Chelsea and I, it's this guy who takes twice as long as my wife. And that's the truth. And you're grateful for it because look how handsome I am. I am saying that, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> you're like, this takes you a long time, bro? Shut up. It can be anything. Give up, give up. And then I would say it also means give in, give in. Paul was Saul and he has this conversion and I'm done. I, I, we're not gonna be able to get to the whole sermon today, but this was the whole sermon. I had to trust God with that, but um, give in, you gotta give in. Do, do you remember what the voice from heaven says to Saul before he comes, becomes Paul and writes half of the New Testament? Do you remember how that goes? He's riding his donkey and God just pushes him out of his Toyota, basically. Like he, he, the Honda breaks down on the road and he has to pull off and he's like, what's going on? And God's like, it's hard, isn't it? To not give in. What do you mean? To like me, you think you're serving me, you don't even know me. I want you to give in. Give in to what, what I'm doing on earth. You're gonna play a really key role on my team. I want you on my team. It's hard to kick against me, isn't it, Saul? Give in. What do you mean give in? Give in to what I'm doing. I'm not drawing lines and categories like you. I'm trying to get all my kids to see me for who I am and I want you to play a part and it's not just about the Jews, Saul. It's about the whole earth. It's not just about your religious sect, the Pharisees and Sadducees, Saul. It's not about the Ten Commandments, Saul. It's about my grace and my forgiveness and my love. I want you to give up, i.e. give in. Give in, Saul. Trust me. And I end with this, with the music playing softly, and then we're going to sing some songs together with all of our heart. Luke chapter 15, Jesus is criticized for having friends that don't go to church and don't smell right and smoke and drink and, and have tattoos like our drummer. <laughs> like I pick on our drummer, poor guy. He's like, I'm a volunteer, man. Um, <laughs> it's true. Um, hey, why do you have these non-church people as your friends, Jesus? He says, let me tell you a parable with three parts. And we get maybe the most famous parable of all. We've got a lost sheep, lost coin, and a lost son. 
I want you to see something. A lot of people believe that these parables are about a number of different things, but every single parable, please hear me, every single parable ends with a party. Every single parable ends with a celebration. Every single parable ends with an illogical celebration. I can prove it to you. The woman with a 10 coin collection loses one coin. She still has 90% of her income, 90% of her collection, but the Bible says she turns up all the cushions and all the chairs and rips her house apart looking for one coin. And then how ironic is this? When she finds the one coin, she gathers all her neighbors and throws a party for the one coin. I'd like to suggest, I think she spends the nine coins celebrating the one she found. The shepherd in the story before, in the first part, he counts up his sheep not to know how many are in the church, but to know who's missing. You better give in, church. We better give in to what God's doing. We better step back and know that he knows what he's doing and he has it all planned out. Maybe God has a plan and a purpose to take what the enemy means for evil and work it together for our good so we can see more of our neighbors and our loved ones know the forgiveness and grace of Jesus. I don't want to fight what he's doing. I want to join what he's doing. And so we're going to count the people in the church not to pat ourselves on the back, but to see if we can tell if anybody's missing. And when we find out if somebody's missing, we'll leave the 99 to go find the one. I say no every month to three to five invitations to speak at conferences and conventions. But when my friend in West Palm Beach said, will you come and do my funeral for my mom that just passed away? Everything within me, which was God said, you're going to go. And so I got on a plane and flew a red eye to West Palm Beach, been on the plane for, I don't know, a lot of hours, and I landed because there were 60 people at a funeral, and probably 90% of them don't know Jesus. And God said, that's where you're going to go. And I got to give in. I'm not going to fight this. We got to give in. We got a city that doesn't know Jesus. That doesn't, I'm not, I didn't say it doesn't know church. I didn't say it doesn't know customs or traditions or commandments or concepts. I'm talking about a city that doesn't know there's a God who's a man and his name is Jesus. And he is the shepherd who counts his children and loves the 99 as much as the one. But I got three babies and I'm telling you right now, if I count three and I only count two, I'm gonna leave the two safe and secure in my home. But you better believe I'm gonna go looking for that one until I find my baby, my baby. <laughs> so we got babies that God wants home. Let's give in, let's give in. The rest of church home will not be counting attendance in auditoriums. The rest of church home will be counting to see who's missing. And whoever's missing, we're gonna go find them. We're gonna give in. Saul, it's hard for you to kick against my plan. You know, Saul had a plan and his plan was a religious plan. His plan was a traditional plan. His plan was the making of men. It was to control people with religion. There was a whole financial system, everything. And God said, it's hard, isn't it, Saul? I have a whole new way of you viewing your life and your world. I'm gonna blind you as a picture to everyone who reads this story. Then when I capture a heart, I change you how you see. I need you in 2021 to change how you see your neighborhood. I need you to change how you see your children. I need you to change how you see yourself. This church does not exist to give me what I want or give you what you want. It exists to serve at the leisure of the king, the commander in chief. And his name is not Joe Biden of the whole earth or Donald Trump. His name is Jesus and he is king and he is in charge. And I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. What could he be doing? Can I tell you what he's always doing? He's always doing whatever is possible, whatever is necessary for his children. I watched a TV show lately and on the TV show, a mother lost her daughter. 
How do you think that mom acted? They, it was a true depiction. It was, they were trying to make it realistic and the mom couldn't sleep. She couldn't eat. She couldn't function. And she called everybody she knew. She started asking people to join the search party. She said, I got it. And you know what? She had a son and that son was safe. It doesn't mean she, she, le she loves her son any less. It doesn't mean she loves her son any less. She just knows that her one son is safe and her daughter isn't. And so she was tearing up the town looking for her. So that's what we're going to do. That's what I'm going to do. We are going to give in. Why? Why is all of this happening? Well, the, the earth is subject to futility and there's brokenness all around us. But, but I have to believe that God knows what he's doing. And he has it all planned out. And um, I don't know. Some of you are like, we can tell, Judah. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And I, I don't have it all planned out. So, so, so what's the secret to my future? Um, to find the one person in the universe that knows what they're doing and has it all planned out and attach yourself. <laughs> Whatever you... You ever, you ever have babies or friends or nephews or grandkids come up and they grab your leg and they hold on? Back in the day, I used to go on trips sometimes and, you know, my son would grab my leg and I'd be like, you know, doing this whole funny thing. I'd be like, I have, daddy has to go. Come on, buddy. That's what I'm talking about. You ain't going without me, God. Because I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't have it planned out. Whew. But you do. And, and I'm, I'm done with this. I, the plan was to drink some water, but I'll get to that later. He says, um, do it for my sake. Anyone loses his life for my sake. Don't hold on to him for your sake. Hold on to him. Because it's him the desire of all nations. He's the fulfillment and the fulfiller. He is the plan. He is the centerpiece. He is the focal point. He is what you crave and long for. He's what you're looking for. He's what you desire. Don't hold on to him for what he will do for you. Hold on to him for him. Because I can tell you in 42 years, I've never met anyone like Jesus. Not anyone. So come what may, my brothers and sisters. Wherever Jesus is, that's where I'm going to be. So what do you do? Yeah, that, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Let's go. You ever had one of those friends? You're like, hey, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off. Oh, I'm going to take off too. You're like, okay, I need a little bit of space here. All right. Well, actually, I'm going to stay. Oh, I'm going to stay now, too. Okay, all right, I can't shake you. That's right. God, what are you doing? That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Give in. Give in. Give up. Give it. <sighs> That's the safest place in the world. <laughs> when you just go... <laughs> What a lot of people forgot about this church and forgot about the way I was raised. I've been here since I was 13. Can I just say this? As much has been made about how Judah lives in LA now and Chelsea lives in LA. And this church has never been about Judah and Chelsea, by the way. It's always been, the point has been about Jesus. But people have said, I'm, I left Seattle. I'm, 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 I'm leaving. I, you, you, you act as if I'm in charge of my own life. I blame you, church, for trusting me to lead this community. I blame you. I sat where you sat and still do. I'm just a part of this church. And my dad was facing what he's facing. My mom and the board of elders said, you need to lead. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna lead one way. I'm gonna lead one way. I'm gonna lead one way. Whatever he says, that's what we're gonna do. And I'll know that he's speaking because I will talk to the board of elders, the lead pastor council and the doctrine council. 
which numbers about 15 mature men and women who trust Jesus, read their scripture, pray and love God. And I will check with all of them. This is what I believe God's saying. This is what I believe I'm doing. And if all of them concur, then we'll know that's what God's saying and that's where we'll go. Guess what we're still doing? That. And you know what the results are? Oh, those are God's. Those are mine, those are God's. We just do what he says. And some will say, well, see, you shouldn't have done that because I, the because isn't really my job. Just do what he says. I just gave in, just do what he says. How many of your parents in here? You know what I'm talking about, just do what he says. We're supposed to raise human beings, God? Are you serious? I can't raise myself. What do you want me to do with these humans? Trust me. Boy, have I learned trust as a parent of a teenager. Somebody in here who has teenagers say amen. God, these are your babies. What do you want me to do? Do this, okay. What now? Do this, okay. I, I've never been a parent before. Maybe you thought I had, I've never been a parent before. I never lived in 2021 before, have you? We're all walking around like we know what's going on, how? Bishop Jake said to me recently, he goes, do you know why we're all afraid? Is because we know we're dying and we've never done it before. We all act like we're doing stuff we've done before. We're talking about 102 and 111. Come on, somebody. We have never done this before. So what's imperative? Give up, give it, give in. Your will be done. What an honor, what a thrill, and what a privilege it is to follow in the footsteps of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is full of grace and truth, and he burns with love for his people. Jesus, we thank you. You said, and I quote back to you, you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. So we are your church and we declare that you are building our lives. You are the architect. You are the builder. You are the leader. You are the king. And so we say again, and again, and again, we give up, we will give it, and we give in. Your kingdom come in Seattle as it is in heaven. Here's our life. Do with it as you please. Jesus. If you're here today with every head bowed and every eye closed before we take just the next several minutes and we're going to use music as a platform of connection with God. But before we do that, if you're here and you say, Judah, I would like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers. I wanna give you an opportunity to do that right now. You know who you are. God is talking to you. God is speaking to you. You don't earn it, deserve it, warrant it. You just receive it and unpack it like a gift because that's what it is. It is the gift of righteousness. It is the gift of forgiveness. It is the gift of acceptance. And you are forgiven forever. All your air wrong and sin, past, present, future is totally and completely forgiven in one moment of faith. If that's you and you want that forgiveness and you want that relationship with God, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. You know who you are. Just shoot your hand up and say, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, amazing, 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 amazing. God, I thank you for every hand in this room that represents the priority of heaven, that represents your passion, that your children would know you, would know relationship with you and forgiveness with you. May that be the passion of church home. May that be the priority of our homes and our hearts. And I thank you for forgiving every single man, woman, boy, and girl who've raised their hand or opened their hearts to only what you can do. And God, we thank you. If we haven't thanked you enough lately, we thank you for what you're doing in the earth. We thank you for what you're doing in our church. We thank you for what you're doing in our families. We thank you for what you're doing in our brain and our 
body and our soul. And we say, don't stop, God. Don't stop, God. We want to go where you go. We want to love what you love. We want to say what you say. We want to see what you see. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Would you join me and stand? And let's join the band in with all of our heart. Come on, let's sing out our praise and our worship to our King.